Good afternoon, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session, Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. And thank you so much because, you know, without your support, I'm not able to come back and to update you on the goings on in our world. Now, this morning, I would like to talk about, did I say afternoon, morning, whatever it is in your neck of the woods? Because <laughs> I know that, you know, that my videos are sent globally and people in England and other parts of the world might be watching and their time zones are different from what might be in my time zone. So welcome to one and all. Now, it is interesting. I just want to speak briefly on some strange developments that are unfolding in the Caribbean and Latin American region. We can see that our region is being transformed, as it were, and we began, you know, with a bang um, in January. Was it January or February, early February, when we had these, uh, the United States Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, Blinken rather, Meeting, meeting with uh, Jamaican officials, right, and also other officials from Barbados. Well, it was the Barbadian Prime Minister, Mia Motley, and we also had Dr. Gonzalez from St. Vincent and the Grenadines about solving the Haitian situation, the gangs in Haiti. And that was interesting because when we look, for example, at Dr. Gonzalez, who sort of masqueraded himself as a progressive as one who is anti-imperialist, you really wonder what, what was he doing around that table? <laughs> that was an interesting sort of development for me. And it is to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that a lot of times when our politicians project themselves as what we call progressive politicians, as liberals, as those who believe in freedom and they are anti-imperialists, don't ever believe them and take them at their word. You have to look at their actions and the people with whom they associate themselves. You've got to look at that. You can't just there with the, you know, narrow mind and empty mind thinking that these people are serious and that they're real because a lot of times they are not real. They're just trying to actually deceive you. And you have not yet grasped that. You think that what you get, what you hear is what is. And it's not what is a lot of times, right? And the Bible says, by their fruits, you shall know them. So when I saw Dr. Gonzalez around that table in Kingston, Jamaica, with all of those imperialists, and the fact that we understand, those of us who have been studying the Haitian situation, we understand that the United States is seeking to dominate right, is seeking to control the political events and the political affairs in Haiti. And that has been happening for decades, right, ever since the United States sent its Marines there in 1915, and even before, but particularly the events after 1915 during that military intervention. We know that the United States literally controls the events and the, the, that's the political events in that Caribbean nation. Right, And there have been oppositions, the people have long been fighting, but we must understand that it's a small island uh, in comparison to this gigantic military apparatus. They will not be able to stand up and win against U.S. imperialism, against U.S. hegemony, something we have to understand. And there are individuals out there who are thinking that, oh, that is your view. Okay. Now, if you don't read, and if you don't read broadly and widely, and if you're just looking at what the mainstream media houses are saying, yes, you will think that that's my view. But if you should get up some books and read them and try to understand and to look at what is happening, the realities, then you'll see that it's not just my view, it is the truth. Right. It is the truth. And truths are absolute. Don't let anybody fool you that, you know, it's subjective. It is relative. Maybe your your journey to arriving at the truth may mean that you need to look at many views. But at the end of the day, the truth is the truth. And we cannot think here that the whole Haitian crisis is only due to the fact that Haiti is poor. 
and there is no context for its poverty. And there we believe that these people are inferior, they can't run their affairs, they do not have the political, you know, dexterity, knowledge, skills to build their economy and to build their country. That is the sort of impression that we, you know, the mainstream media is giving us. And you believe it. But let's move away from that now. After the whole matter of the Haitian thing and the, all of the developments into, into the fact that we have now troops coming from Jamaica. And I understand that's a joint event. You have both soldiers and police. And I'm wondering, what are police doing there, Jamaican police? I mean, we can't even put a dent in our crime. Crime is, has been a terrible um, aspect of our reality, of our social and economic reality and political reality in Jamaica for many decades. And our politicians have not been able to solve that crime problem, that crime monster. They have just not been able to do that. But all of a sudden, e in, even though we are branded as the murderous, if not one of the, if, well, one of the murderous nations, if not the most murderous nation in the world, yet we are sending Jamaican troops and policemen, perhaps women also, to Haiti to solve their problems with gangs. And we have problems with gangs in Jamaica. Now, you let that sink in and try to let me understand the rationale, the, what logic is behind that sort of thinking and that sort of decision. I don't know. Perhaps you are brighter than me, you're thinking, you're, you know, you're a deep thinker. I am not. But it doesn't make any sense. It cannot make any sense that we have our people being murdered daily. Jamaicans are being murdered and slaughtered by gang members. Right? And just by marauding criminals every day. It's an everyday reality. And yet still, we are able to send troops. I think I read you an article from Michael Abrahams the other day when he said Jamaica the sinking ship. And he mentioned that there was about 70 or 73 murders committed in three weeks in Jamaica. In three weeks of a population, out of a population of 3 million people, you had 73 murders committed in three weeks, just in three weeks in Jamaica. But to you, that's nothing. You know, it's, it's the norm because we're living in a democracy. And in democracies, you have to have some killings. Murders are what should be the norm in a democracy. You must not have a sense of, you must not be the sense of security in your individual space. Because once we can go every five years to elect another prime minister, that is all we need for democracy. And we can chat on talk show hosts and chat a lot of nonsense, right? Then that is the hallmark of what a democracy should be and is. And Jamaicans, even those who say that they are educated, are finding themselves being deceived by that sort of false doctrine. Right? How can Jamaica be a democracy when we don't even know what is happening with the IMF, right? We don't know. We're just carrying, you know, pieces of information here and there. But nobody is doing any investigative analysis in terms of what is the status with the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, right? We Nobody has really analyzed objectively Dr. Nigel Clark's stewardship of that IMF agreement that he actually inherited from Audley Shaw in 2018. Nobody is talking about that. Those are six years of our lives, people. Six years of the Jamaican economic life that Dr. Nigel Clark was stewarding, was shepherding, I should say, right? Six years of the Jamaican economic life. And you're telling me that, oh, he's getting up to, to go. It's nothing, right? He, yeah, he saw the opportunity and he has to go, right? 
But what is the status of that agreement? Can we have some light on that? Other than he has shepherded and he has been a great steward of the Jamaican economy and or macroeconomics and we can stand up the shocks. Now, talk about external shocks. He's suggesting that we can stand up and, you know, to economic shocks. At the, at the end of the day, we had a hurricane, hurricane barrel, and there were crises. And I think there are still crises. And it doesn't seem like we have the money to take care of those crises. So where is that money? What is the reward? What was the benefit or what is the benefit of having, you know, gone through such austerity? Right? Because Jamaicans had had to ban their bellies as according to them. They had to make huge sacrifices for this IMF agreement and austerity program. This structural adjustment program, which was, you know, it, it really boggles the mind. It really boggles the mind how intelligent people could have allowed themselves to have been duped by the IMF. But if I can dupe you and I have no sense of morals, no conscience, then yeah, I'll dupe you. And I'll take you as a fool. I'll wield you around like a stick, like a cane. And that is what our Jamaican politicians and our economists have allowed the IMF to have done with them. But what is sad is that they're not, we're not just talking about the politicians because what they do have a huge impact on people's lives and their livelihoods. So when we're talking about Dr. Nigel Clark, we're not just talking about an ordinary man. And I had a conversation the other day with a friend of mine who was saying, oh, Dr. Nigel Clark is an ordinary Jamaican. How can Dr. Nigel Clark be an ordinary Jamaican? And we know that he's an ordinary Jamaican in terms of what is on paper. Theoretically speaking, Dr. Nigel Clark is a human being. He's a Jamaican citizen, just like any other Jamaican citizen. But when we look at his social and economic status, he is not an ordinary Jamaican. He is the Minister of Finance. He is the one steering the economic machinery. And if he does not do a good job of that, of steering, of shepherding that machinery, the entire nation can collapse. In fact, I would argue that even though we have also on paper that the prime minister is the, you know, in terms of rank, he's the highest in rank because he's a head. Well, you know, the governor general is the head of the nation, you know, because we're still a constitutional monarchy. But, you know, you know, in, in terms of what we say, the democracy, this for democracy that we think we have, the prime minister stands at the head of the nation. However, when you look at the fact that the responsibility the gigantic responsibility that the Minister of Finance has, I would put his position over the Prime Minister any day. Because if we don't have a good economy, if we don't have a healthy economy, we can't have a healthy society. Everything in our society is going to collapse. We need to have a healthy economy. And Jamaica has not had a healthy economy since independence. Right? We have not had a healthy economy since independence. And people like to talk about other countries. When you talk about the problems that the bedevil to generate. So tell me about, look at another country. You know, if you want to look at Trinidad, if you want to look at Barbados, if you want to look at Venezuela, if you want to look at, you know, the United States, if you want to look at England, if you want to look at France or any other nation that you choose. Right? Most of these nations had some years of prosperity in which their citizens thrived economically, socially, all right, and politically, if you will. We have not had one year, Jamaica has never had, not even a year of prosperity. We have lived all our years of austerity in which 
we have been told by successive governments that if they just implement these economic strategies, these economic policies, all will be well. And at the end of the day, it's never well. It's always well for a few, for the oligarchy, but not for the majority of citizens there. And if you say that Jamaica is indeed a democracy, should it not be a democracy for and off and by the majority, by the people? Because democracy means that the majority rules, right? It is government, you know, it's consent of the government that we should give our consent, that we should give the government our consent. And if we don't give the government our consent, then they can't do, or they can't implement policies that they often implement at the detriment of the masses of people living on that island. So now we have been told, I was reading in the Financial Times, that we are now viewed as the poster child. They're not saying that the IMF is not bragging on Jamaica's ability and its decision, its slave-like, uncritical um, decision, I should say, to have implemented a very austere economic structural adjustment IMF program. They are lauding our efforts, even though we are poor. And they're suggesting that Perhaps Nigel Clark going there as a Jamaican, he's going to be able to implement the same policies for other parts of the world. That's what he's being sent there to do. Right? He's being rewarded because he has made the Jamaican economy poorer, not wealthier, and not that it is on a good footing, as he's suggesting on TVJ, that we are in the best place than we have ever been. <laughs> now, you know, sometimes when I listen to Jamaicans speak, this island mentality, right, having the, the, the intellect of an, of an islander, we are living in a global village, right? This is not just about Jamaica. This is about living and functioning in a global community in which the, the, the survival of the fittest is a mantra. The survival of the fittest. That is the mantra. That is the order of the day. It's a pecking community. And if Jamaica is not strong enough and does not play its cards well, then we're going to have the predators, the economic predators, right? Devouring us without any mercy. And that's exactly what they're doing right there now. And our citizens cannot really perceive what is happening because to them, Nigel Clark is a citizen of Jamaica, which he is, and has all right to jump ship because guess what? That's how the world runs. Having No, we're not saying that Nigel Clark doesn't have the right to jump ship and to go wherever he chooses. But he was the one who actually decided that he would be a part of this political regime of the Jamaica Labour Party. And he would have been at the helm of the, of the economic, um, you know, regime, if you will. Right? And he has made decisions that has culminated in the devastation of the Jamaican economy. It has not really set us on a strong ground. We are not stronger economically than perhaps we were in 2007 or before. We are much weaker because we are more indebted. And, you know, talk about that. I am going to present to you an essay that was written actually by... I can't remember his name, but I'll tell you, you know, in my next video, I'm going to reveal that article. I'm going to actually read that article to you. I'm going to explain and discuss that article to you that he wrote about the fact that our debt, our Jamaican debt, has 
increased. It is not going down, as we have been told. And this writer is suggesting that, or he said, that he tried to contact Dr. Nigel Clark about his analysis of what is happening with his IMF agreement, and Dr. Nigel Clark blocked him on X, former Twitter. He blocked him because he doesn't want to engage in any transparent conversation about the state of the economy. Right? But yet, citizens are saying, yes, why are people against Dr. Clark leaving? It's not that Dr. Clark is the is 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 that important. Is the fact that he was the one staring the economy for six years. And we want to know what has happened or what has he done? Has he participated in any acts of corruption? Any acts of bribery? And what is the state of the Jamaican economy? We don't want to just hear that the macroeconomics are great, the macroeconomic fundamentals are excellent, because we have been hearing that since the IMF came in, you know, we entered into another agreement since 2014 15. We've been hearing that from Dr. Peter Phillips, and Dr. Nigel Clark has been saying that ad nauseum for all the time that he was in office. However, that's not translating into the lives of the people. The people are struggling. They're struggling to buy basic things like groceries. People can't afford to pay their rent, their mortgages, right? To send their children to school. Lisa Hanna, in, a, in an article that in an article that she wrote for the Jamaica Observer, spoke about the fact that they can't even a lot of our people can't even afford protein, you know, to buy chicken and other, you know, meats. They just can't afford to do that. Now, I'm not suggesting that they have to eat meat. But I'm saying those who were able to do that and those who are meat eaters can't afford to buy meat in many cases because it's too expensive. Even a loaf of bread, that's a basic carbohydrate, is far expensive for the typical Jamaican. I was watching a video on TikTok and it was a lady there, you know, vendor was telling us that people come and buy a slice of bread and, you know, that sort of thing that we say, two slices of bread and the cost that she said, that she actually intimated, was something that is, is unbelievable, right? For a poor country like Jamaica. Now, if we do not deal with these economic inequities, how do we think we're going to live in peace? How do we think we're going to live as a law-abiding society? Let's not even talk about that, because people say we're a democracy, and in every indicator in terms of law and order, Jamaica is going to be ranked second to last, <laughs> right? If not last, because we are a lawless society. We are a lawless society, yet we are this great democracy. We are this great democracy that the world needs to copy. Right, and that is why Doctor, um, the famous professor there at uh, at Harvard University, Professor Orlando Patterson, his book is entitled actually titled Jamaica, the Confounding Island, because it it's really a confounding island, but it's not really confounding. I think that if Professor Orlando Patterson was truthful to himself. He would have said that there's nothing that is really compounding, confounding about it. It's that this is what it is. It is a slave plantation. Right? But he didn't want to say that because that would not have been diplomatically correct. Right? He has to present himself as this sophisticated professor who is not able to declare what is what and to and to say something for what it really stands for right we are confusing ourselves we continue to confuse ourselves at the detriment of 
many generations to come because we have not dealt well with the economy. This is an ongoing matter from 1962. You know, and I was reading an article yesterday and I realized that Jamaica became a member of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, in 1963, one year after independence. And, you know, I'd like to one day come on here and talk about the history of the IMF in Jamaica because something that we don't know and we have to educate ourselves about I think we just hear things here. We read an article here and there, but we have to put things together. We cannot synthesize. And that's the problem that many of us are unable to synthesize information. We're not able to pull information together and say, this is the view now, you know, and this is what I want to say to one of the reasons Jamaica is not doing well is because we have too many different views. And I can imagine when people go into boardrooms and decision-making rooms, they just have all of these views and we cannot really, you know, synthesize these views and say, what really should we do? We are indecisive because of these views that are, sophist uh, are suffocating, I should say, or development, stunting or development, because we everybody there is bright, especially if they have a degree. They're all bright and they know, and, you know, and a lot of times they don't know anything. They haven't read enough. They haven't informed themselves enough. And yet they're lecturing people who know. So I, I talk about the IMF and I've been studying about the IMF since 2003, 2004. And I'm a diligent student of the IMF in terms of understanding what this organization is all about. Right. In fact, I pursued a certificate in international relations when I was doing my master's at Howard University. Right? I didn't have to look at economics, but it really was fascinating to me. Could have done something cultural, because I love to study languages and cultures, but I chose the path of economics. In fact, when well, I, mean, I had to write a thesis, I believe a, a paper, might not have been a thesis, but a paper on some aspect of economics. And my professor, my language professor was asked, Andrew, why did you choose such a very complex topic. Why did you look at economics? Why didn't you look at something cultural to, for this certificate? But I just wanted to understand. And when I, you know, having listened to Life and Debt, that documentary about the IMF Structural Adjustment Program in Jamaica, I was flabbergasted to know that we grew up without understanding, fully understanding what the IMF and the World Bank are what they represent and the fact that not much is said about neoliberalism and neocolonialism which are really buzzwords for neo-slavery and jamaica is going through the process of being enslaved being recolonized yet another time and people there are just comfortable with it they think that this is the world that they live in and they have their views and those of us who are sounding the alarm, we're not listening to other views because there is no absolute, absolute views. And, you know, truth is absolute. And I would encourage all of you there to study what is truth. And truth does not only have to deal with spiritual affairs. It has to also do with the economy, with the political realm, with education, with your social well-being, with your scientific understanding of the world. And that is what was happening during the pandemic. People were didn't understand what is truth. They were clamoring for facts. Oh, I have the facts and I know the facts. Yes, we should try to, you know, compile the facts before we come to a real understanding of what is truth. But we have to ask God for what is truth. So right now we have the IMF and we are the predicament. And don't tell me that Nigel Clark leaving. You know, two things as I talk about Nigel Clark. One, if Nigel Clark had finished his term and having finished his term, he was going to the IMF 
I would have no problem with that. I would still want a, an assessment, an objective assessment of his stewardship of the economy under the Structural Agreement Program of the International Monetary Fund. I would definitely want to have that analysis because that is what a democracy should stand for. And an intelligent mind would want to see him do that. So having said that, second, you know, I would not also, if Nigel Clark was going to a university, say he had to leave to go to university. I mean, I would still require him to finish the program. You should finish what you've started. There should be some clause in what the, these politicians are doing that you should, unless you're fired or something, you know, something of emergency, whatever happens, you should finish what you started. Because government is about continuity. And people say, oh, Nigel Clark has a team. Yeah, he has a team, but he stood at the helm of the team, and I'm sure his team could not tell him what to do. He is the one who had the last word. Look at Dr. Nigel Clark. I'm sure they would not, you know, he's the one who stared that economy and what the, 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 the majority of the decision, the bulk of the decision lied with him. And his pronouncements, his decisions, right? So we have to really try to understand the context when people say that he's jumping ship. We're not just saying he's jumping ship. You, you can't compare Nigel Clark to a teacher or to a nurse, because Nigel Clark is the one who is at the helm of the economy, who should have created a healthy economy for these teachers and nurses and also other professionals to remain in that society, to encourage them to stay there, right? But that's not what he was doing. He was actually building the economy for the oligarchy, right? For the few people who are there and by extension for a few of middle class, because you know you have some middle class who are going to be lucky, who are at the right place at the right time. And they then think that that is the norm, but that's not the norm. The majority of Jamaicans are suffering. And that is why you see the teachers and the nurses and the doctors and the engineers are leaving in droves, right? And then when you, so, so you, you have a situation in which in, even intelligent Jamaicans are conflating the two and saying, well, Dr. Nigel Clark, he's a professional too, right? And, you know, uh, an opportunity comes up for where he can you know, earn a better salary, right? He can be more, be more you know, famous, right? And he is just like another. But many of the teachers who left Jamaica would not have left, or the nurses, if they were getting a reasonable salary and they could live and they could buy their homes. But Dr. Nalika can buy his home, can live comfortably in Jamaica if he wants, right? So why are you comparing Dr. Nigel Clark who was staring the economic wheel in Jamaica to a teacher who had nothing to do, whose decision was not even asked for? And they have to, you know, earn the salary, a salary that they didn't deserve more to, to, to earn, but they don't have any sort of influence in determining how much they get, how much they're paid. And you are going to compare Dr. Nigel Clark with a teacher and a doctor and a nurse. What is in your brain? You know? What is really in your, your your brain? And that's why I can't talk to people who think as narrowly like that. I have to immediately end the conversation. I'm sorry, because that is just too low to think. You have to elevate that thinking because there's no way you can compare a teacher to Dr. Nigel Clark in terms of their roles, their status, and their responsibilities. It is idiotic to do that. If Dr. Nigel Clark had created an economy in which these professionals could have lived comfortably, and I'm not suggesting that they are going to be rich. That's not what we're saying now, that they're going, overnight they're going to be rich and they're going to be paid as much as Dr. Nigel Clark receives, right? But we're saying 
a society in which they could live comfortably. They could take care of their children. They could have a car. They could, you know, comfortably pay their mortgages and have a lot of savings in the bank. Right? If he had done that, and I'm not just suggesting here, Doctor, that Dr. Nigel Clark is the only one to be blamed. We're talking about, you know, previous governments too, but Dr. Nigel Clark is the one in power right now, and he's the one who's leaving. I can't recall, and you probably can correct me, any minister of finance, apart from if the fact that he had been fired or probably got ill, who just got up and left to go to a multinational institution, a multilateral institution during his tenure in office. Dr. Nigel Clark could not even wait until his the, the entire regime was finished, or the the IMF did, has not has has no respect for Jamaica really, because what they should have said is that you know finish your term, right? Because really and truly, had he finished his term, what could we say? The guy would be in opposition, and if he got a position, then yeah, he should go. But at the same time, we should also have a keen analysis an objective analysis of his stewardship of the Jamaican economy, which we don't have. All we're seeing are glowing reports about Dr. Nigel Clark's legacy and that we can't do without him, right? He is an indispensable man, even though our economy is weak, is fragile, and is about to collapse. Right? But that is what we, you know, that is what, that is the manner in which Jamaicans think and operate. The thinking is so low, is so infantile, that sometimes I really wonder why even have a conversation with lots of us. Because we cannot think. We cannot think. All we think about is the fact that Dr. Nigel Clark is some, what do you call them? Um, celebrity, and you defend him to the last. We're not talking about that Dr. Nigel Clark. Dr. Nigel Clark is minute as far as I, 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 I you know, he's, he, I, you know, he's not really occupying my mental space. I am just looking at him because he is the one at the helm of an economy that is suffering because of his role, his status. That is why we've got to speak about him. And that's why we're speaking about him. He's not that Nigel Clark is a very important man. But his role, his responsibility is an extremely important one. Because it's talking about whether Jamaicans will be able to survive or not survive. Do you understand that? And stop talking about this. Just talk about Nigel Clark. When you are coming at me with your arguments, come at me with his stewardship, his policies. Were they healthy? Did they help our economy to grow? Have we expanded the economy? Or are we shrinking? Is the economy being shrinked? That's what you have to say. Now, and if we can say these things with evidence that the economy is doing well and we can see in the lives of the people, then we can say, yeah, Dr. Nigel Clark, we're happy and we, we will miss you. But why are we saying we're missing a man that stood at top an economy that is fragile, that's not even functioning, right? And these are the progressive personalities, characters of which we speak, right? He's a progressive person. Now, we see now that um, another interesting development, as we say that Jamaicans have sent their troops to Haiti, and police officers. I don't know what the police officers are going to do in a country like that. We can't. The police in Jamaica cannot even control the gangs in Jamaica. So how are they going to control the gangs in Haiti, who have very powerful weapons coming from the United States? More powerful than perhaps they have ever seen and have been exposed to. It is weird. These are some bizarre developments that I can't really grasp. I look at them, but I say, Lord, what really is happening behind the scenes? Because it does not make any sense. It's not logical. I mean, it's not rational. And I am a rational, intelligent being.
right? I don't know. Why are we there when we have serious problems with national security? Hmm? But it's to tell you that our government is not transparent, that our, the, our government is also not democratic. Right? We should thank God for the democratic institutions we have and the freedom of religion and at least we can move around. But, you know, we move around, but we also move around at our own peril because we don't know from day to day as we move around in that country if we are going to be the next victim of, of crime and violence. Dominicans just don't know. So even though they have that freedom of mobility, but their lives can be snuffed out at any given moment, at any given second. Right? But yet still, we are happy in that sort of, you know, the for democracy. It's, it's a forced democracy. It's not really a democracy. Right? Not because we vote every... In fact, people are saying we vote every five years, but what is the percentage? It's a of people who are voting now. People, you know, we are suffering from voter apathy. That like even Prime Ministers uh, Patterson, PJ Patterson and Golden, former Prime Ministers of Jamaica, have been concerned, have been expressing their concern about voter apathy. Because if people are not voting, if they don't see voting as changing the circumstances in their lives, then, you know, what sort of democracy is that? Right? What sort of democracy is that? So even the false democracy that we have there is fragile. Right? So I don't know. You must tell me what you think is happening. These strange developments. The fact that, you know, the people who we think, look at the Mia Martlis. You know, she was also praising Dr. Nigel Clark. So she pretends as if she's also another anti-imperialist. Yet we know that the IMF is an imperialist institution, both the IMF and the World Bank and the IDB, right? They are imperialist institutions used by the U.S. military industrial complex to run countries and to control their resources. She knows that. She's not stupid, but she presents herself as a sheep. As a, you know, she is really a wolf in sheep clothing, but she does present herself as a sheep. Right? Someone who is standing up to U.S. and other forms of imperialism, but she's not. She's not. I mean, because she, why would she be praising Dr. Nigel Clark for going to an imperialist institution to work for an imperialist institution. Well, some would argue that he's going there to represent us and to perhaps reduce the imperialism. <laughs> Dr. Nigel Clark is not able to do that. Right? And Dr. Clark does not have, does not present that persona as someone who is willing to do that. To, to me, he's just someone who does what he's told to do. That is my assessment of Dr. Clark. Right? He's not one who will rock the boat. He does not also behave as one who is very knowledgeable of history. He doesn't have that sort of aura. He doesn't present that sort of person. Right? He doesn't have it. He doesn't have that. He probably is good at putting some maps and to, you know, calculate some figures punch some numbers, and you praise him for doing that. But a lot of times, these are also software that they use, and they have their predetermined statistics. And he just punches some numbers, and he tells you, and you say, wow, he's great. And, you know, all of these also sophisticated computers and uh, softwares, and they give you all these wonderful, nice-looking graphs, <laughs> right? And you think that Dr. Clark went and he actually crafted, he drew those graphs and he, no, he didn't do anything. He just punched in some numbers and the graphs are made. And, but these are predetermined figures. These are predetermined statistics. 
but you trust him. You think that he actually did it and he he's a great man. He's a great thinker. Right? He doesn't really have anything much to do. Right? And that is why we are where we are right now. Because he is just a puppet to do what the IMF required of him to do. And there's no other view about that. Where's the view? Where are the views? And when I talk to people, oh, you should listen to other views. What is the other view? Right? And if the other view or your views were correct, if your view and the other views were correct or accurate, then I would see it in the economy. <laughs> because what you see must be something that you can prove, that is concrete, that you can see. Right? And when you go to Jamaica, what you're seeing is an impoverished state. A people who are destitute and desperate. For the most part, I'm not suggesting now that you don't have your nice neighborhoods and people who are living appreciably well. But I'm suggesting on the most, for the most part, what we have are people who are extremely poor, who are living in abject poverty. And the more you listen to the news there and the news on even on YouTube and the people who go down and this is going to the world. And one of the things that is ama that stands amazing to me is that if you watch Jamaican news on YouTube and you see the journalists going down into these communities, these depressed communities that they act afterwards, you know, upload and bro broadcast to the world. Why are you telling me that I'm, you know, why are you broadcasting or dirty linens in, in the public? But they're doing it too. Just watch the news in Jamaica and you see that goes throughout the world. And you can see the level of destitution, the level of incivility that is ubiquitous, that runs through the length and breadth of Jamaica. And people are very comfortable with that. So to end this video, with all of these strange occurrences. Now we hear that, you know, the prime minister has gotten a, a doctorate. So where is he going with that? We wonder now if, you know, he's following is in the same footsteps with his friend, um, Nigel Clark, and he'll also be going to a multinational institution. Having said that, I'm wondering if the stage is now being set, if this is going to be a new precedent, right, in which our leaders you know, align themselves with these neo-colonial, neoliberal institutions who support them in government. And after they've implemented these disastrous policies, they're going to be moving on to these, to work for these multinational institutions, I, uh, these transnational corporations. I don't know. But we have to be careful with this whole Nigel Clark's precedence in terms of leaving a job undone, unfinished, right? We have to be careful because some of our other ministers can just go there, implement disastrous policies, and then they can leave. And you Jamaicans are going to say, yes, they're just another Jamaican and they're, and you're going to be happy that they're going to, you know, be another Jamaican working for a neoliberal, neocolonial institution because you love that. You love it. Even if Kamala goes to the presidency tomorrow, you love if she would be there and she goes to Jamaica and she kicks you. You love it because she is a Jamaican in the White House. Right? That is how you love things. You just love to be enslaved. It's your joy. It's your privilege. I end this video by saying, <laughs> keep on ending the video, by, but I'm going to end it right now. That had Marcus Garvey, even when Marcus Garvey was alive, Marcus Garvey was a qualified man, a skillful man, a great orator, right? A brilliant mind. And yet, I'm sure the US and other you know, members of the world in Europe would have wanted to recruit him. And he could have worked for any multilateral institution and would have gotten lots of money to betray his people. And he knew that if he had been working with these organ or for these organizations that he would be betraying his people, but he decided that he would not do that, right? And he took up 
an unthankful job of working, of mobilizing his people and his own people, or some of, I should say, some of his own people betrayed him. Not only in the United States, but also in Jamaica, betrayed Marcus, Marcus Mosiah Garvey. He was betrayed. And I'm sure if Marcus was living right now, that many of you would have said, just like you're saying to me, he's talking foolishness, right? Because he was not speaking what you're hearing in mainstream media. You would be following the W.E. Du Bois and all of these well-clad and intelligent men who were just working in the beginning and for most of his life for the establishment and talking about the talented 10th and, and all of that stuff. That's what you'll be doing. Because all you want to do is to present yourself to the world that you're important. <laughs> and people can say that you're working for the IMF or you're working for Wall Street. Right? And these institutions, these transnational organizations are the same organizations that are responsible for what happened in the global meltdown, the financial meltdown of 2008, and continue to set the trend for another global economic meltdown. You better wake up. You've got to smell the coffee and wake up and stop talking of nonsense about listening to several views. Listen to views so you can compare and contrast and look at consistency, but you better get to understand and you better familiarize yourself with the truth because the truth is the truth. Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you'd like and share. And I'm looking, I'm looking forward to uploading another video um, sometime soon. And I'm going to talk really about the IMF. Did we really grow? Did we really reduce our debt? I want to really come back and talk about that. Ciao.